Hey guys, thanks for joining. Welcome once again to Tor Talks. My name is Chris Trot, and this week I am joined by a long-standing supporter of TaylorMade, someone who's been with us almost throughout my whole career. He's won two majors, held winning Ryder Cups, won a Players' Championship. There's pretty much nothing this guy hasn't done, in addition to being one of the nicest guys we've got on staff. Martin Keimer, welcome to Tor Talks. How are you doing? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, strange times, but uh, I think I managed so far fairly well. It's, it's, it's super unique. And before we even get going and start to talk about products and stuff, I noticed the other day you did something very charitable for your foundation through uh, setting up a Just Giving page. and You donated a large amount yourself to kick that off. Tell us a little bit about that and I know we talked about the foundation before and how it's helping children, but what inspired just to try and do that at this time? You just, I think you just wanted to help. Well, I think there's a time, time in our lives where certain things just feel right to do. And you, I reflected a little bit on my own life, what we have, how privileged we are, um, and what, in what situation we're in. And um, I thought, I thought it was really necessary for me to do something for myself because it felt right. And through my foundation, I thought it was a really nice uh, yeah, approach, you know, with my foundation that I had over the last five or six years. Um, it started in, in South Africa, um, that idea of having a foundation because I supported a kindergarten there. Um, and that's why I always wanted to support that country as well. Um, then obviously I wanted to do something in my own country in Germany because that is, you know, I am the person who I am because of the country where, where I'm from and they gave me so much. And then I wanted to pick Italy. Um, Italy has been for me a country, the people there are so warm, they're very loving, you know, it's a very different culture than we have in Germany. And uh, especially in Bergamo, they struggle so much. And for me, it just felt right to do the right thing and, and to help because, you know, 50,000 euros for my for foundation is a lot of money. Um, but in, in that world that we live in with that job that we have, 50,000 euros can be earned within four days playing a decent tournament. So, and it can save lives. It can save lives in, in, in those three countries. And hopefully we can get to 100,000 euros by the end of, um, maybe the end of April. And then we can really help. And that's why I just wanted to do that. You're very, like, I've noticed knowing you through time, and, and we'll get to this bag and why I keep, I don't have many staff bags. I could just about cover this area. But this is one of the few that I have. And it obviously, you know, it means a lot to you. And it, it means a lot to me and our relationship that we've had. You're very close or have been with myself and Adrian Wrightfeld over the years. And seeing you mature now and reflect and doing the things that I think that we all like to think we would do if we were blessed to play tournament golf, I think it says a lot about you as a professional and you as a person. Is this time now something that you're using to reflect more than ever before? Or are you resetting goals? Because you know, you're coming through this season you're, you, you're starting to build momentum with the 2020 season. I'm sure you had goals for the summer, but what are you using this time to do with yourself? Is it more reflection again and reset? Um, I think it's very, very difficult right now to have, to have any goals because I don't know when we're going to play again. I don't know if we're going to play at all in 2020 again. So... I mean, no one really knows. So I, I try to stay away from setting any goals. I had big wishes for 2020 by the beginning of the season. Um, I was playing well. I played really good the first few events that I played. So I was on the right track. And then, um, and then the, the coronavirus happened. So I really use that time right now to reflect on my life. Not, not, not only on golf, but also... What else can I do besides golf? Because it's very important to have a balance. And when you're a professional athlete, you don't really have much of other things to do because that sport takes so much out of, 
out of you in terms of energy, focus, time. And right now we have time. So I'm not bored at home. So I, I, I was looking the last couple of weeks into, into different things, maybe playing the guitar, learning Spanish, um, lear learning something to do in the backyard. You know, last week, my, my dad and me, we, we built a wall out of concrete. I never had an idea how to do that, but now I know because he taught me. So we have time right now. So I use that time to reflect on things. What else do I want to do besides playing golf? And then I sometimes I catch myself because I have that need to play and I have that longing, you know, to, to hit a golf ball. And that's why for me it was super important. I know we, we talked about it briefly a week ago. And I also talked to Adrian about it, that I, um, I have a, a golf simulator now uh, in, in my warehouse that we actually wanted to film there, but I can't drive there right now because the police didn't let me. So um, those are just circumstances that are very, very different. But I try to stay on top of things, try to work on my golf game more in technical ways um, because, you know, hitting into a net or against the wall, it doesn't do much. You need to see the flight because golf is an art. You know, you need to feel it, see it, and 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 you don't have that right now. So I use that time for for, for many different things, but uh, it's also a good time. You should so also focus on the good things that you can do right now, and not only focus on the things that you don't have. So there's a couple of things in there. One guitar. How far down the line with learning the guitar are you? Um, I can show you, there was a couple of days ago from Amazon, I get those, those little things that you get on top on your fingers because it hurts so much, like the, the strings on my fingers. And I thought, no, I don't want to go through that pain. So I make it a little bit easier for myself. So they arrived a couple of days ago. I downloaded already a, a couple of sessions um, from YouTube that I can, because these days it's so easy to learn. You just need to put in a little bit of time and, and, and look, go, go on YouTube and you find it pretty much everything you need, especially at the beginning. So you're ready to give us a demonstration? Are we getting a demonstration out of you? Um, maybe if we're, gonna, if we're gonna do the same thing again in, in two months, I'm sure I can play, I could play a little bit. Oh, if you man. do the same thing, I do the playing. And then, and then when Martin Keimer drives around Germany, to try and get from location to location and get stopped by the police. You must be at a stage now, they must, everyone must recognize you in Germany and even there's no passing for you to get around? No, 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 no. It's, uh, and, uh, let's say even if they would recognize me, it's the wrong thing. You know, we are part of one country. There are 82 million people in my country. So everybody has to behave the same way. It doesn't matter who you are and what you have. If that's a rule, if Angela Merkel set that rule, then that's the rule, you know, and that usually works very, very well in my country. Um, but I just thought I can go to work. Yeah. You know, that I understood that I can go to work and this is, um, this is possible, but in that circumstances, the last couple of days, it wasn't. So I need to accept it. It's okay. So tell me about um, your development over, and, and again, this is from your PGA win. This is the back. It was you, you and me. We did that driver, or you did that driver. I remember. I do remember because, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, for me, it was a big milestone in my career because it was the first major championship I'd been involved with that anyone had gone on and won. I'd worked majors before, but to make a super try for the guy that goes on and wins is amazing. Yeah. Obviously, that's why this bag means a lot to me. But for you, and you look at where you've come from there to where you are today, I remember, and Adrian and I, Adrian Reitfeld, who nowadays looks after your equipment, he and I were talking about it only yesterday, and we were talking how far you've come when it comes just to equipment. Because back then, it was very difficult to get Martin Keimer to change. Martin Keimer had a way of doing stuff, and you had to slowly show and be like look i think this and it was little increments and then we talked about the sim this year you've gained sort of six seven mile an hour ball speed from eight months ago nine months ago when we look at where you're at you've had a big increase in speed going into the sim going from the pga championship at bell reeve adrian said you played a final round there with rich beam and 
that was a turning point Adrian felt like that you guys yeah. <laughs> that was a big turning point for me yeah because I didn't want to accept that Rich Beam hits the ball longer than me come on who's a, who's a lovely guy but I mean he's a, he's a bit older than you but I mean than me that's a fact yeah yeah how, so how have you embraced it so much and taken the data now that's available and be like, I have to catch up. I have to get as long as the guys I can be as long as. Well, first of all, it had, it had to do a lot with trust. Um, after we worked together from, I believe it was 2009, maybe we worked for five or six years. And for the last three, four years, I worked with Adrian. Um, just gaining that trust in, not in the people, but in the product that the people know how to use the product. It's very difficult to find um, good reps who really understand how to use a product towards that individual player. And obviously with, with you and me, it started off really, really well, you know, winning the first major and really finding and believing that what we are doing is the right thing. And then I need to open up myself and obviously the, the results, they, they proved us right. Um, but for me, it was just a matter of just, yeah, just being brave and try different things. And right now I do. And um, last winter, that was a huge improvement for me from, from the M3 driver to the SIM driver. Um, obviously I, I did a lot of fitness as well, but the reason why I was gaining, yeah, I would say almost 17 yards in the air um, within seven or eight weeks from the M3 to the sim driver, doing a bit of fitness at the same time. But I did a, I did a testing in, in Florida. Um, I took the M3 three days in a row, 20 balls every day, and the same with the sim driver. And the average was 17 yards. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So uh, if people tell me, you know, if, the, if they bring out drivers every, every year a new one and they, they should go five yards longer, that they don't really believe it, I don't believe it either because they go 17 yards longer. So in my case, that was the truth. <laughs> For sure. But in all that, you went full out and you, you came forward in golf ball and changed golf ball and everything. I mean... How did Adrian did a great job here? You did a great job by trusting him. What were you guys, were you honestly that strict? 20 balls, 20 balls. That's how we're going to do this. Because you, you never know, you know, every day you feel different. And when you're on the range and you hit driver after driver after driver, of course you gain speed. Of course you gain yardage. But I wanted to have three separate days, three the different time of the day, and not having to hit 50 drivers before I make my measurements. I hit the first 20 drives with the M3, the, and then I made a break from maybe 30 minutes, and then I hit another 20 drives, but with a sim driver. And I did that three days in a row. And that gave me the belief that whatever the number will tell me now, this is the truth. Because it's, it's not, I'm not standing here for three hours and, and trying to reach that 180 ball speed or something because it comes naturally and and that is i want to prove to myself that the new driver is really better because i need to see it and i need to i need to feel it in, the, in those three different days and then i called adrian and i said it's unbelievable so awesome so tell me about when i go back through stuff and anytime i get a chance to speak to you you always get a, a sort of realization that you're talking to one of the greatest players of my generation and you go back and Pinehurst comes to life. And that tournament that week, were you in a zone there or something? I mean, you, you won it by, I think it was eight shots. Like no one dominates majors like that in this day and age other than Tiger had, but no one had seen that. Where did that come from and the domination and the way you played that golf course? It was very surprising for, for, for me too that I was, I was never really struggling. You know, there was never one day or, or a few holes where I had doubts, where, where I thought, ah, Marty, maybe you can throw that away right now. I was so clear 
of what, what I was doing. I was playing the first two days. I was playing so solid. And my confidence level on the greens was so high. Um, I don't think I missed a putt within eight feet all week. And this is huge, especially on those greens. Um, I just, I was, I felt really, really calm at that time. I knew exactly what, what I had to do after, after Friday afternoon. Um, it was not defending the shots that I had, that, was, that I was ahead. It was more trying to prove to myself, maybe I, I can beat myself again. On Thursday, Friday, I shot, uh, I think it was 10 on the par. So maybe I can beat myself on Saturday, Sunday. I know it was not possible because it was more difficult, but that was my mindset. Okay. It doesn't need to be the result, the score, I don't need to beat, but I can beat the, 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 the game of golf, the way, the shots that I hit on Thursday, Friday. Maybe I can hit better shots on Saturday, Sunday. Maybe they, they lead to a different result, but I can hit better shots. And that was my approach. And um, it was really cool. You know, I was playing really my own tournament without really looking, looking at, at, any, at any other scores. I mean, that's amazing. So when you went to bed on the Saturday night, was there any fear or nerves or edginess about you? When you, you, you know, you're, you're sleeping on a lead like that. Yeah, it was really helpful that my brother, he was with me um, the whole week. We also shared a room and we, we, we chatted a little bit, obviously about golf, but also about other stuff. And which helped me a lot. And I already did that in Sawgrass um, in the same year. I never watched a golf shot on TV all, all week. I didn't want to hear the uh, Frank Nobilos, Rich Learners um, about how well I'm playing, what, what I can win, what I can lose. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see how I played. Um, I just really, I was quiet. You know, I was reading the books. We went for, for, for dinner. And, and that was pretty much our Saturday evening. Um, and then obviously the week after I was watching it. But at that time, it was really important for me to stay in the moment. Don't try to think ahead. Don't try to reflect too much on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, no distractions, you know, that, that was really important to me. And I didn't need it for my ego. Because usually, you know, a lot of players, they want to see themselves on TV when they, they like, when people talk about them. Um, but fortunately, at that time, I didn't really need it for my ego at all because I know at that time I knew where I was and I knew what I wanted to do the next day. So it was quite clear. And you talk about pressure putting and you talk about how you didn't miss at Pinehurst. I know the players that year, you had a putt on 17 that you held across the slope and I remember that one being iconic. Then there's the winning putt at the Ryder Cup. There's all these great moments. Yeah, anytime I watch you practice your putting, at tournaments, you're not as, it doesn't appear like you have it as technical. It, feel, it looks to me like it's more of a free flow. Now that might be looking like a, a swan that's calm on the top and pedaling like mad underwater, but you look like a natural putter, a free flow putter. Is there anything you can help us all out with here during isolation and quarantining around the world that Martin Keimer practices right now to try and get his putting in a place he wants it. I mean, believe it or not, but I, I try to become a little bit more technical as well. And I, I try to find that balance of keeping my, keeping my natural flow in combination with, with a bit of technical parts. Um, I'm working hard. Um, um, and, um, and, um, become a little become bit more, a little more consistent, consistent. You know, in sawgrass in, at the US Open and other tournaments I putted well but then I had weeks where I didn't putt well at all so right now I'm working a lot on my alignments on my posture um, the, the ball position what you know the basic stuff that everybody can do at home um, so there's not, not much I can do in home, at my home right now. Um, fortunately, at the warehouse where I have the golf simulator, I also have a putt view. Um, hopefully, I can go there next week again. But I just try to work on the basics. That's, um, that's very important to me. And you mentioned the basics. You mentioned ball position. But where do you want to see your ball position? Because almost as if 
Because, look, I'm practicing my potting like everyone else. I'm set up here. Let's see if you can give me a little hand. Let me line this up so it's perfectly in. We get some of these lines in a position where they're good. But where do you want to see ball position? If someone's in here and they're, if I've got that line down on the ground, do you want to see it left of centre for a right-handed golfer or do you want to see it more centred? And then do you want to see some shaft lean or do you want to see level? What do you, what do you like to see? I think your, your ball position right now, you know, that, that, white, that white line that you have, if you, if you align the, the, the shaft with that line, that would be really important to me that, that, the, putter, that the putter is straight, that, that the lie is not behind or in front of the ball. It has to be very, very straight. And, that, that over, and, and this is what I was talking about earlier with the ball position and the alignment. Now you know that your club face is, is square, square to, to, to towards your target line. But the putter look, looks very much, um, yeah, very much square towards the other line. So, so that, that setup, that, that would be quite good for me. For me, sometimes my right foot moves forward and therefore my right shoulder moves forward and then I aim left and then I, and I miss a lot of putts left. And that is just something I always did. I always pulled. So through, through a different you, ball you position. Get shoulder, you get this way. Yeah, I get okay. forward. Yeah. So yeah. I, my, my, my ball position, or my, my shoulders, they were always in this position every single yeah. time. Right now, I just try to put my right elbow closer to my rib cage, and so therefore, my, my shoulder. When I go forward now, it's a very square and, and, and parallel towards my. Uh, Tell me, Martin. We haven't spoken about this. Have you looked at putter length in order to impact that? Because Rory went from thirty-five and a quarter to thirty-five in an attempt to move that in there. Now look, he looked at his analytics and he lost a bit of pace control. So he went back to 34 and a quarter. But a lot of the feeling was that he was too short that way. Go longer, yeah. get in there. I mean, it's something to consider, right? Yeah, there could be something I, 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 can, I can talk to Adrian about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but because no, yeah. setup, setup is so important. You know, whatever you put in, you, you will get out. If you put in, you're going to get out. That's just how it is. So you need to be very careful how you approach a golf shot in a long game and in a putting. And especially putting is such a fragile thing. So yeah. that's why, you know, working with, with you guys on the putting green, having some input of your experience. Now you, you're telling me that about Rory. Now obviously, you know, you work with all those great players. So we can help each other. And uh, I, I didn't, I didn't know that that he has done that. But obviously, if you if you talk a different length of putter, then it will, yes, of course, it will change. I mean, John Rahm is using thirty seven, and he's not that tall, and he's using a, a thirty six, sorry, thirty six putter, and he stands with the eye line outside. And then again, he likes to, eat. It, like you, it's amazing how many of these top players all just focus on. How am I positioned here, here, yeah. here? It's, it's, and I think that's the thing. But if we look at full swing and what you're doing in your simulator, I appreciate you've perhaps got a slightly set up where you can see the ball fly a little bit. But is there anything we can do? Because again, I know at tournaments, and I grab this one here, but I know at tournaments you have something similar to this, but with a much yeah, smaller I, ball. Well, this very easy one that you have. It's very big. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have a tennis ball. Unfortunately, it's in the warehouse now. Otherwise, I would take it out, out of the bag. But I, I use it pretty much just for the rhythm because my arms, they were always quite fast in the backswing. And then my, my shoulder turn, it was too slow compared to, to my arms. And then I lost, I lost the synchronized. You know, I wasn't really synchronized. Um, so, but it also helps a lot with, with pitching. 30 to 60 yard pitches. If you take the tennis ball between your between your forearms, you know you're so so connected. And I can imagine Jason Day. He would be a perfect example for that because he doesn't use much of, of of risk with chipping and pitching. Or Steve Stricker. Mm -hmm. Those are two guys. They they use a lot with their with their shoulder without without hinging their wrist so much. And for me, it was about the pitching and chipping but also about the rhythm in my next one. 
So you're trying to use this, you say rhythm, but to give the guys watching an idea, you just want to stay connected, is what you're trying yeah. to do. Now, now the shoulders and arms, they, they, work, they work backwards in, my, in, in your backswing together. And sometimes for me, my arms, they were too quick. So when I have the tennis ball between my forearms, it all goes, goes back to, to together. And, and that, that was the original reason why I used the tennis ball through my coach back in 2014. Um, but now I see a lot of guys on the range using it, I don't know, for, for maybe the different reason also. I tell you, I find it tough enough with this, so the fact that you're using a tennis ball, I don't think I'm going to get there. It's very the driver, you know, once you take a driver because it stretches your, your shoulder so much and, and, your, and your neck, it's quite difficult, but uh, it's fun, you know, it's just a training aid and then you let loose again, so that's what we do. We need to suffer first in order to have fun. So there's a lot, a lot of great stuff in there. And then when you go and play a tournament, you forget about this and just focus on target. Like how does that work? I think that is the most important thing in golf. You know, you work on the range and then you, in an ideal world, you, you let loose of everything and just let your body take over and do what it's supposed to do because we are all good enough. So you practice on the range and then, and then try to forget about it and just play. Because in the golf course, it's about playing, try to manage your low score somehow and not trying to think about any technical stuff again. There's a time where you need to think about technique, but when you play a tournament round, it's too late. You can't have two or three swing thoughts. I don't believe in this. You know, I have maybe one swing thought when I play. Um, ideally, you have nothing. But this is very, very difficult. But if you have one swing thought, it's very manageable. The rest, you should leave on the range. Yeah. And then before you go, we've got to do a what's in the bag. But I wanted to ask you about um, the Olympics. And, you know, obviously you represented your country in 2016. It's being postponed this year. But where does that stand for you in terms of achievements? And anytime you can go out and play for Germany. I know you're a great soccer football fan so that and it is it's the equivalent i assume right yeah i mean the olympic games back in back in rio it was for me one of the greatest experience that i had in sports because um you know when you play rider cups when you play majors it's all about golf and which is obviously is understandable but when you go to the olympic games you're all the same there's no real superstar we are all great in, in that sport, what, what we do. And we have all been through the same thing. We all had to go, we all had to work, we all had to make a lot of sacrifices. And that really inspired me, um, the respect for, for each other. It was so cool. And um, I would have done it a little bit different this year. I would have not stayed in the village the whole week. I would have stayed only three or four days and then moved into a hotel and treat the Olympic Games, that golf tournament, the same way than I would have treated any other golf tournament. Because it was too much distraction for me. Which was okay for the first time, now I know. And it was a good experience, good to make. But now I would uh, try to take it a bit more serious in terms of preparation. Because sometimes I went to, to sport events until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Because I just wanted to see it. You know, see Usain Bolt. Uh, running and, and, and going to handball games and, and karate and yujutsu and stuff. It was cool to see. Yeah, yeah, no, I bet. I mean, an amazing experience. So, what's in the bag right now for you? I see the okay. golf bag so behind it, you. Yeah, let me show you. Um, let me change the camera quickly. Why can I do this? And I've got to ask, because I know he's a big part of the team, where's your brother at at the moment? Is he uh, at yours, brother, or is he at a different place? No, no, he's in, he's in Munich right now because he, he lives in Munich. Um, maybe he will come over the, this weekend. Okay. Um, Eastern. So, so that's, that's a lob wedge, 50, 58 degrees, which I think is pretty cool. The, the black shafts, people ask me a lot if it's, uh, if it's a graphite shaft or so. But uh, I really like that black finish. Um, then the gap wedge, um, it says 54, 
but I think it's only 52. You should ask Adrian. <laughs> um, pitching wedge and then the Tiger Woods clubs. Adrian and me, were, we, uh, we, we met last year in Wentworth and we, we went through the whole set because I asked him if I can, if I can get one because they really, really look cool. So, and that really improved my, my, my game as well because I thought blades, I mean, you, you, you know better than anyone else on tour how, how many times I've played a blade. And it was very difficult for me to go to any other, other golf club. Um, and I mean, so, since I play the Tiger Clubs, I must say, the, if you miss, let's say I hit a 7 nine hundred and sixty five 165 meters when I hit a normal 7 nine. If I miss it a little bit, it still goes 160 or so. The old blades, they only went 250, 250 uh, 150, 155. So that was a big thing for me that I don't lose too much yardage. Um, so, and that's very difficult for blades. Um, so there was, there was... A couple of questions already. Why is 58 the most lofted club you have? And do you ever change the 58 and put in a 60 or even a 64 if you're playing somewhere different in the world. And then the next question is a two-part question. The, why use blades? If you get such a, um, you know, such, the feedback is so precise, why mm. not give yourself some room? Before we get into the top end of the bag. I, I grew up with blades. I think this is the, the right way to play golf. I mean, it's... Um, I also think the look and the feel in golf is very important. You know, when you look down, it has to look good. It has to look like, okay, if I make a pure strike now, you get that vibration through that shaft, through the grip into your hands. And you only can get that with blades. And, you know, those tire clubs, um, they're very for forgiving for blades. So... I grew up with them and I feel like I can, I can play my best golf in blades. So um, in terms of the lob wedges or the higher lofts, um, when I was a kid, I had a 64 degree lob wedge, but the last four, five, six years, pretty much I only had 58. I think you don't need much more than 58. I mean, if you have a look at the old school golf players, you know, for example, Ola Saba, he was one of the best players in the bunker. He only used the 56 degree. You don't need much. And he won the Masters, you know, a couple of times. So um, I'm open to, to try. Um, but how often do you really need more than 58 degrees, Trotty? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I hear it. I just wanted to hear it from you because yeah. I see on the PGA Tour, a lot of players, 60, and then you go into Dustin's of this world and the crew that he hangs out with and plays practice rounds with, and he influences them, and they're on 64s. And I see Rory turn up with pretty much every loft we make every week, and then he makes his decision based on what he's going to play based on the golf course. And it's always good to get, you know, the only way I can get better is by there are questions that I prepare for this and there are questions that I ask as we go through. And it's to hear what each player thinks and what makes them think. And I think that's why people love these tour talks because we can find out, you know, what do you do? You know, I must agree. I'm, I'm maybe with the wedges, I'm at the same point where I was in 2010 with my irons. Maybe I need to be a little bit more open. Maybe I should try a few different lofts, a few different lies and bounces and stuff like that, you know? I, I, I tried. And I want to interrupt there. But if you remember at Sawgrass, I came to you and spoke yeah. to you about Plateau, and you were not for that. And it's like, I was just, I, I, I'm sorry, I just think you should try it. I, I, don't, I don't care if you play it or not play it. it. It's on you, it's you. But I just see people using this and I see people get having success. And at the afternoon, you came back and said, you were right. That, that's, that's really good in rough like this. From the bunker and from the rough, it was a big difference. I, I, I agree. But, you know, sometimes maybe I need to be forced. Maybe I need to be pushed a little bit into trying something. Because, you know, this is against my natural. You know, if something works for me, I'm happy. But they can be better. But sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm too stubborn with stuff like this. It's funny because when I talk to you, you're talking to someone who 
I love the tradition of the game. I don't play enough golf. I would, I would use blades myself if I played more. But in these bags, under these head covers, there's a wooden driver in there that I hit every now and again. You know, I love it. But I also recognize being around week in, week out, guys of your caliber, that these players that do accept more loft and stuff, I think they have an advantage. And now the yardage gains you've got off the tee, your, your yeah. speed is up there again with the as it should be with these players. And I just think that you bring in that much more yardage at the front, you're going to get closer. You're going to be able to get more aggressive to the flags. If you get more aggressive every now and again, that might short yourself, short side yourself in a situation where you're really up against it. Now, you talk about Alathabal, we throw in Semi Ballesteros. They're the two examples that are probably the best short game players in the world. The modern day guy who I, I always like to talk to about chipping and he's still open, Jason Day. And here's a guy that has 60 degrees and you've already said the technique he uses doesn't manipulate shaft lean or bounce, stays very connected. And he has the grit that you all have to get it up and down from anywhere. But he will stand yeah. there and say to me, I'll get that golf ball up and down from anywhere. Now, he doesn't use more than 60, but he also doesn't use 56 or 58. And I just think it's – I'm in a different situation. I'm not playing for my – to win the tournaments. You are. I mean, and you you the boss of that situation. And I think that Adrian does a great job when we talk to players. It's a balance. The player's the boss. If the player's not comfortable, we have to leave the player to do what he has to do. Of course. But I also feel with you that there's stuff to be learned from just having a conversation with Jason Day and you ever got in that situation. Because, you know, he wouldn't use a 64, but he'd use a 60. And he's magic. I mean, he's a magician. He gives you some of the best yeah. information out there. Yeah, a, I mean, I'm always... Especially now, you know, once that that virus is over, hopefully we can, maybe we can even meet in Florida also and just, and just go through a few options. You know, for, for me, it's just a matter of, I just need to make the time to try different things. And and this is my weakness, you know. I, I believe there is still room for improvement. It's just a matter of me telling you guys, listen, I would like to get some help. What are your ideas? So, yeah. Uh, it is something that that I can do with Adrian with, without any problem. You know, he's he's very very helpful. So once that thing is over, there is something definitely something I, I need to get into because there is room for improvement. I know that, but it's just my own laziness sometimes. And we talk about you, you're very hard on yourself, Martin. I mean, you, you're not you're not a lazy tour player. Trust me. You no, know, if you see it, it's the truth. I'm. Uh, how can you how can you stay with, with the same loft for for three or four years? You know things changed, and uh, I, I need to I need I need to get to it a little bit quicker. And one of the things you talk about changes. One of the things I want to see is that sim driver in yours. Let's uh, let's have a look at what you've got going on. What what setup is there? Is it? There you go. I know this little bit. There you go. Can you see it? Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what loft have you got on that? And what shaft is in that one? Well, it says 8.0, but I think it's 8.3 or 8.4. That There was also an idea from, from Adrian to put that shaft in there. Um, there was a Easy. guy from... Um, the guy he used to work for, for, for Taylor. Sean Moore. Yeah, Sean yeah, Moore. Sean. Yeah, Sean and Adrian, they were working on that a lot. And I was first... First, I had a sixty, uh, like a seventy-five um, gram shaft, but it was it was too heavy for me because I needed more speed. I wanted more speed, and then they put a sixty-five in there. Now, now, now I'm pretty happy with it. Yep. That's awesome. And your grips, you haven't changed your whole career. Any reason for that? No. Can you remember those, those grips you, you 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 got for me? That they, they're still now they're called BCT. I don't think that yeah. they, they do the old ones anymore. You know, can, can you remember the ones that you guys ordered from me? 100%. We, we listed them the Martin Keimer grip, but they had a different, uh, they had a different full cord compound than the other ones, than the BCT. Yes, it was a bit more cord in there, I think. Um, I think I still have one more box left in my, in, in the back here. Um, yeah, and then I, also the, the, the putter, I, 
I changed the putter um, this year. I went to the truck and I said, I, I struggle with, with putting. What, what, what do you have? And I just went through that bag that they, that they had there in the corner in the TaylorMade truck and then I just took it. And there you go. Boom. What sight line have you got on that? Or any sight Sorry? line? What sight line on the top? Oh, you got any no, just the top just line. I, I had a short line first, but I didn't really like the short line because I put a ball, like a line on the ball right now. And, and what I have right now, you know, I have a, I have a line that goes from, this, from the beginning of the ball all the way, all the way to, to the back of the putter. And that's what I like the most. So you rely on the line when you putt? Yeah. Yeah, right now I do. Because since, since I work with, with a putting coach, um, I think we want to try that, especially for those short and mid-range putts. Because I always struggled with those mid-range putts. I, I made two little putts. And, and with the spider putter now, I feel like I have a bit more consistency in my stroke. It's amazing because you've been like a Soto or a Daytona guy. But obviously with the spider, the toe hang there at 32 degrees, I think that yeah. people feel they can get that release on a, a mallet putter. And I think that's been huge for spider. Well... Martin, it's, uh, it's fantastic to talk to you. You're so generous with your time and you're, you're so insightful. I mean, there's so much in here that honestly I have no clue how we're going to make sure that people capture all of it. I mean, I feel like I've become a better golfer just listening to you. So thank you so much for everything you do for TaylorMade, everything you do for the game of golf and everything you do for your foundation. You know, that doesn't go unseen. It's, it's a super generous thing. And you being you, you talk about it and, and pass it off as if it's, it, it's, it's not, it, it's a huge gesture. It really is. And uh, I know I appreciate it. and can never talk highly enough about you when people ask about our tour staff. Thank you very much. I also, also want to say thanks to, to, to you guys. You're a very faithful company with a lot of... Uh, professionals working it's very difficult to find to find good tailors to, to good, find good reps you know who understand it again what i said earlier but uh the guys that, that, that i work with um at taylor mate they really helped so and it is much appreciated as well well i appreciate it and anyone tuning in thanks so much for listening this is uh tour talks and hopefully you get as much out of this as i have any comments, leave them below, whatever platform we put this in. We do read them all. So thanks, guys. Much enjoyed it. Martin, we'll um, speak to you soon. Be safe, my friend. And no doubt I'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Trotty. Cheers, buddy. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>